I'm Thomas Neuser. I'm a lecturer in plant sciences at the Faculty of Life Sciences at the University of Manchester. The first question we got is, can plants drown and if so, how? Now, if, like me, you've managed to uh, overwater more than one pot plant in your life and drowned it that way, you do know that plants can indeed drown and they do. So what's easy to overlook is that, so we all know that plants produce oxygen and uh, we know that of course they could use that same oxygen to basically live and breathe. Uh, over the lifetime plants produce more oxygen than they use but there are times especially of course at night when they need oxygen and uh, during the daytime of course continuously they also need oxygen. So if you uh, stop a plant from getting oxygen for example by saturating soil with water or by submerging the whole plant in water, then they can't breathe. Now plants can deal with that better than animals can, but over time, so a plant can for example survive uh, a couple of days, a week or more, completely submerged, but then uh, it gets into trouble. If it's only the soil that's being submerged, sometimes many plants have ways of uh, piping air basically from the aerial tissues down into the roots. But not all plants can do that, and so sometimes crops uh, get into trouble if, for example, the fields are being flooded. So the qu second question is, how do plants grow with artificial light, and uh, what type of artificial light we need? So there are two things we need to bear in mind when it comes to plants and light. The first is how much light they get, the intensity of the light, and the second point is uh, what quality of light or what wavelength of light. It's easy to underestimate just how bright the sun is on a sunny day. And so if we try to recreate that intensity of sunlight in a room, uh, we need quite a lot of lamps. Now the good thing is plants have found ways of dealing with very variable amounts of light. And so if you grow them in lower intensity light, that's kind of okay for most of them. So they grow a bit more slowly, but uh, they can deal with that. What they do need is though they need the right quality of light. So they need red light to do photosynthesis and they need a little bit of blue light as well to regulate growth. And so you can recreate that in the lab. We've had for a while in our growth chambers uh, artificial lights, LEDs, that uh, provide the plants with a lot of red and a little bit of blue. And those growth chambers looked a bit like a 1980s disco. And so, but the plants did grow quite happily. But generally what you try to do is to give them white light and mix enough red and a little bit of blue in that and the plants grow just fine. The next question, what do you think about the idea that plants can feel pain? I could make it easy for myself and say that uh, if you ask a neuroscientist, pain is something we, uh, that our brain creates. So uh, as the saying goes, no brain, no pain. Plants don't have a brain. They've got no central nervous system. They've got no uh, processing power anywhere that's like a brain. And so they cannot feel pain. You could also argue that in terms of evolution, we feel pain to make us react very quickly to danger, to difficult situations that we want to run away from. And it makes us react very quickly. So take that hand off a hot plate, run away from danger and so on. And plants can't do that because they're rooted in place. And so you could argue it doesn't make sense for plants to feel pain in the way that we do. Having said all that, plants do react to the sorts of things that give us pain. So, for example, if you cut off a leaf of a plant or if you crush it or something like that, we know that they react to that. We know that there's an electrical signal that's sent from the wounded place throughout the plant. And uh, many of these things like uh, insects chewing on a plant or a cow grazing on a plant do trigger some responses like, for example, the plant trying to defend itself. Some of them do that by producing compounds that make the leaves taste bad, for example, to herbivores and so on. So the responses to wounding and to danger are a lot more subtle than you would get uh, from uh, an animal that feels pain. Uh, and there's no brain that processes this information. But plants do react to these things in a way you could then say they feel pain. The next question is, how does poison ivy cause itchy rashes? This poison ivy is one of the plants that make me feel glad to live in Europe because it doesn't grow here. Poison ivy and a number of related plants belong to a small family that grows in North America and in Asia. And all of the members of this family produce in various degrees um, oily resins. And in Asia, craftsmen have used this kind of oily resin 
to lacquer wooden uh, boxes, for example, and furniture. And it's really beautiful craftsmanship. And uh, the reason these plants give us itchy rashes is kind of related to this uh, producing lacquer, actually. Because, as I understand it, now I'm not an immunologist, but um, the, this oily resin with an active ingredient called urushiol, with a Japanese name, um, triggers the same sort of contact dermatitis, that is, the kind of uh, rashes you would get from contact with latex, for example, or with nickel, as some people have that. What's unusual, though, is that in most cases, allergies are being caused by a specific protein or something like that. And um, typically, it's only a small number of, pro of people who are allergic to that particular protein or that allergen. This is different for poison ivy because this oily resin, this urushiol, um, has a family of chemicals that all have uh, the same property. They've got a tail and a head. And what the tail does is to slot itself into the membranes of your skin cells. So it really sort of sticks there. And the heads have a funny way of um, supergluing themselves, each other, and proteins of your skin cells into one big lump. Essentially, they're lacquering your skin. And as I understand it, these lumps of proteins and these molecules in your skin are very strong triggers for allergic responses. So this is why most people actually do have these responses to poison ivy, unlike things like a peanut allergy, where only a small number of people are affected. Next, we've been sent this picture of a plant, and uh, we've been asked, my dogs both love to eat this plant, what is it? Now, I should admit I'm not a classically trained botanist, but as far as I can see, what you've got in that picture is a jack by the hedge, or garlic mustard, which is a plant that grows all over the UK, and it's um, actually quite nice to eat for us as well. I'm surprised that your dogs like it, but maybe they are gourmets and love eating these salad greens. The final question we've got is, can plants attack one another, such as through chemicals sent to nearby plants? Um, I sense from this question that you probably uh, know the answer a little bit already. So plants have the ability to um, exude chemicals into the ground. And the principle of affecting other plants nearby with these chemicals is called allelopathy. And uh, typically it's done not really to um, kill other plants or to uh, really stop them from growing completely, but basically to give the plant that makes this stuff a competitive advantage. And garden owners might have seen this sort of thing with walnut trees. So right beneath the walnut tree where the roots grow, there is a zone where some plants just don't like to grow. Some plants are fine with it, but some plants are quite sensitive to this. So walnut trees produce a chemical, in this case called uh, juglan, that gives that walnut tree a bit of a competitive advantage. And we think, although we don't know for sure, but we think that many plants do something like that, not to kill their neighbors, but basically to have a bit of a competitive advantage.